The Unshackled Waves, Episode 71. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms here for this week's review episode and I'm joined once again by my co-editor-in-chief of the Unshackled, Sukut Fernando. Welcome again. Thanks Tim and hello everyone. And boy, what a big news day it's been. Well, today when we're recording this, it's Tuesday, the 18th of July, and the day's not even over yet. And there's already been some major uh, announcements uh, following Scott Ludlam's uh, revelation that he was a dual citizen of New Zealand last Friday. We have just found out today that uh, Larissa Waters has also resigned because of uh, dual citizenship as she was born in Canada. Now, under Section 44 of the Australian Constitution, uh, dual citizens are ineligible to be in Parliament. It's hard to believe that they both didn't check and it raises the questions, if the Greens can't manage this, how can they run a country? Uh, Section 44 has now uh, been in the news. There's demands for reform, but I don't think Australians want uh, foreign citizens in their parliament. Also, some important news happened in the past week. We're beginning to win the war against political correctness and identity politics in Australia because the leftist media has started decrying Australian racism. This is because uh, people have been critical of Waleed Ali, Yasmin abdel Magid, and Tim Supamasani. So all that it shows is Australians are not racist. They're just not taking too kindly to be called bigots all the time and told that their country is awful. Also, it was announced today, uh, earlier today, that Australia will get a new Home Affairs uh, Department. Uh, It's caused a bit of division in the government and security experts. Many believe our agencies are working together already and and they've asked, is it really needed uh, uh, when everything is working so well? But given that we are, the terror level is increasing. should, should it be required? And there's also concerns about uh, whether our freedoms will be eroded with this new uh, Home Office. But we'll start with uh, disarray with the Greens. And well, it was out of the blue on uh, Friday that uh, Scott Ludham, because he'd been a senator for nine years since 2008, that was extraordinary enough. And then today with Larissa Waters, uh, also resigning because of dual citizenship. I mean, what's going on here? Yeah, I think it's common sense for people to check whether they are eligible. I mean, Larissa Waters said that um, she just found out that she was a dual citizen just yesterday um, afternoon and that, you know, she got the notice from the Canadian High Commission, I think it was, yesterday. Um, Well, again, I find that story a bit unbelievable because something like dual citizenship is something you would know for your entire life unless, say, you were an orphan or something. But even then, even that case, um, you, you would see something you would know. And you know, it just raises questions about how the Greens actually do um, recruit candidates um, for, their, for their purposes. And maybe, you know, as, as we know, the Greens, um, it's one of their policies to reform Section 44. So therefore, it's not surprising that they would um, intentionally, if they did, that they would intentionally recruit people who are dual citizens in order, you know, try and further their, try and further their cause. Or well, maybe the Greens have forgotten that uh, the current constitution still applies, and so while it does, they need to stick by their eligibility rules. Uh, but you would have thought that uh, Scott Ludlam, like, he was born in New Zealand, he knows that, and Larissa Waters knows that she was born in Canada. Ludlam's explanation was more extraordinary. He assumed that when he was uh, naturalised in Australia, he assumed that was the end of his New Zealand citizenship. What, did he just think he's citizen? citizenship would magically uh, disappear, that it wouldn't occur to him to just maybe double check, especially if you're going to run for federal parliament and the same with Larissa Waters. Yeah, I think that's what that's what makes their argument entirely inconsistent. Um, you know, they're saying that you know they, despite being born in Canada, for example, she she was born in Canada and she moved here one week after her birth. And Scott Ludlam, despite being born in New Zealand, they're saying that you know there are no there are dual citizens, but they should know that you know the fact that they are born in another country means that they should check whether you know they are actual dual citizens instead of waiting till one of their colleagues are caught out. Um, 
uh, as being a dual citizen and therefore ineligible ineligible to stay here. Um, again, you know, it raises questions about you know whether the Greens want to actually you know conform to this constitution or they want to you know push for their effort, push for reforms um, and you know recruit senators to do that. But the thing is, it hasn't worked this time because they have been caught out um, and therefore they, they have left the parliament. You know, we are hoping that other Green senators are also like that, um, but then they'll be replaced anyway. But it's good for their, well, it's bad for their PR. Yes, I wonder if uh, Larry Annan is still uh, citizens of the Soviet Union. Yeah, or Cuba or North Korea. <laughs> Uh, and Richard Di Natale, the Greens leader, held a press conference uh, just recently saying that obviously uh, the Greens need to reform their internal governance to make sure that uh, this doesn't happen again. Yeah, no shit. You should have like done yeah. it. This is basic stuff. And it was interesting. I was watching yeah. uh, Weekend Agenda on Sky News when uh, Aunt Anne Ali was on and she was asked because she was born in Egypt, I uh, was asked uh, you know, if she checked that uh, if that she'd renounced her dual citizenship. And she said that the Labour Party was very thorough and making sure that, you know, she uh, sent all the, the forms to the you know, Egyptian consulate and renounced her citizenship. So obviously the major parties are doing their due diligence here. And of course, yeah. yeah as I said, if the Greens uh, don't even know if their polit uh, candidates are eligible to sit for Parliament, how on earth can they run a country? Yeah, I mean, this is common sense. I mean, if if you know that your this particular candidate was born in another country, you should be asking. If you're the party first, you should be asking them um, to prove that they are, you know, a citizen of Australia and nowhere else to prove that they don't probably have any, you know, um, a conflict of interest or any, any, any split in their loyalty to another country. Um, and if you are the candidate, you should make sure that if you were born in another country that you would try and find out instead of waiting nine years. I mean, he didn't even find out. It was after an investigation that he was found out, he was caught out. Um, you know, instead of waiting all these years to find out whether you are a dual citizen. Um, you know, um, Larissa Waters, she used the excuse, you know, I was just a baby who moved out of Canada. I didn't know. Well, I'm sorry, but you know, if you know you were born in another country, it's common sense to find out. Um, it's not hard um, to, and to ask them. And again, it's your party's responsibility also to make sure they have this process um, that the other major parties have. Again, I think it, it's quite inconsistent and, you know, maybe it's not even an accident, maybe it is intentional. Um, and if it is intentional, I'm not surprised because, you know, I don't, I, I expect the Green to do things that um, go, that, that, that violate our constitution. Uh, and it's interesting because under the constitution, uh, they're required to pay back the, the salaries that they earned as a senator because they never should have been there in the first place. Now, the government can, yeah. uh, well, the special minister of state can uh, waiver that requirement, which they did for uh, Bob Day. Um, they probably will do for Scott Ludlam and Larissa Waters, though George Brandis said that uh, given you know how uh, mean Scott Ludlam was to Bob Day when he was found to be ineligible like it's uh, it's quite ironic for him to be crying poor now because he said I only own a laptop and some sneakers yeah I think they should carry out what the law says you know if they if, if it has to be reversed then it has to be reversed um, and that's what it says especially for people like you know I'm especially I especially want the Greens to to experience that um, but you know in all fairness you know I think it, they should um, carry out the law and Tell them to um, you know pay back the salary um, somehow in one way or another. Um, you know maybe they'll raise donations. I don't know, but you know it might encourage them to further um, complain about this capitalist society. But oh well, that'll make them look even more stupid. No, I think that's a bit much. I think that the day precedent should apply and that should be wavered, which I think is what will happen. I mean, it'd just be a nightmare to like recoup that money anyway. It would be, yeah. But I mean. Because they are the Greens, and we want them to, you know, go down as much as possible. But yeah, I think, you know, um, yeah, I think in in that case, you know, if you do look at their personal lives, and it'll be hard to repay. Then yes, we need to be compassionate after all. Um, but yeah, I think most likely the, the the reality is most likely they will um, waiver it and allow them to, you know, not not pay, um, which I guess, you know, isn't a bad solution, but you know, not not the ideal solution. <laughs> 
Now, of course, there there were demands after Ludlam was found to be ineligible, and there obviously will be further demands today that Section 44 of our Constitution should be repealed. It not only deals with uh, dual citizenship, it also uh, says that you can't be a member of parliament if you're a bankrupt, uh, been convicted of a criminal offence which carries a penalty of one year or more, been uh, convicted of treason or uh, keeping, earning a profit uh, from the Crown, which is what Bob Day was found ineligible for. Now, the, the claims are that uh, this is an outdated uh, section, and it's been pointed out that Australian citizenship didn't exist at the time uh, the, the Constitution came into effect in 1901. Australian citizenship uh, was first introduced in 1948, before that uh, Australians were British uh, subjects. So that, that's the argument there. But I believe that that, uh, that Section 44 is put in there for a reason, because the last thing we need is politicians in our federal parliament who have have uh, foreign interests and a, a conflict of interest. I mean, especially in this age of globalism, uh, that, that's the last thing that Australia needs. Okay, that's a given. I mean, you shouldn't be, if you are a dual citizen, you should not be able um, to, you know, apply for a position in the parliament. You shouldn't be able to run for run for office. You shouldn't be able to, you know, um, Get, 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 be, an, be a candidate in elections because, you know, as you mentioned, then you, you might actually have a conflict of interest. I mean, if you had a Middle Eastern person, if you had Anne Ali from Egypt you know, and she was a dual citizen, you know, imagine, imagine the problems we would be having. You know, we can't trust people like that. Um, so, you know, you cannot, it's, it's, you cannot, you cannot, I mean, it's common sense. You cannot actually run for parliament, you know, go into parliament by being a dual citizen because we can't trust you. That's the truth. The reality is we can't trust you. You could be doing something for someone else. Now, um, with the argument about the, you know, how Australia didn't have citizenship, well, it's, it's weird because it's almost like they're saying that, um, you know, Australians were nothing before that, you know, it, which doesn't make sense. As you mentioned, they were British subjects, which is a different story. So they, they still were considered to be something. Um, but back then, they didn't need to have this sort of concept anyway, because, you know, there weren't people um, who were migrants like this, um, you know, we know that it was only after um, mi the Migration Acts were changed and we got different migrants. Um, that's when we needed these things called citizenship laws because, you know, because we had people from different parts of the world coming in um, and we needed to, you know, actually make sure that they are Australian. So, you know, the the, the the situation right now, the the society right now is a different place. Um, so you can't just say that back then, you know, they didn't have laws when right now it's a different society and you need to have those laws to make sure you preserve what the society back then had. Uh, and another argument against Section 44 is that it was never meant to apply to citizens of other Commonwealth countries, such as New Zealand and the United Kingdom. And obviously, two countries of the, the Commonwealth are never going to declare war on each other because the Queen is both head of state. But they're still... Even Commonwealth countries, they have their own national interest and have disagreements from time to time. Uh, that I pointed out in my article that... Uh, Bill English, the New Zealand Prime Minister, criticised changes to Australian citizenship laws and said the relationship could be uh, strained. So, you know, uh, Commonwealth nations do have uh, disagreements from time to time. And so, yes, it is uh, correct that, you know, we don't allow dual citizens even from other Commonwealth countries because they could potentially be conflicted when being called upon to act in Australia's national interest. Yeah, I mean, if you look at particular maritime borders or something, then it's going to, there, there will be a conflict of interest um, if you have particular people from the Pacific, you know, countries in the Pacific coming to Australia, you know, due to those maritime border conflicts or, or anything to do with international law, there's going to be a conflict of interest. Um, I personally do not mind um, having British dual citizens um, in Australia, in the parliament, because, you know, they are British. Um, I think because they are, you know, the, the, I guess in many ways, the mother country. Um, so, you know, I don't mind seeing B British people here, but I do mind seeing other um, com people from the Commonwealth um, who are dual citizens in parliament, because that's a different story. You know, those are actual different countries. Um, and the conflict of interests are too important, you know, they're, they're, they're too um, big to, to, to ignore. So I think, you know, it should apply to all citizens, maybe not British citizens, but again, I wouldn't mind if it did apply to British citizens after all. And Australia is uh, 
you know, gracious enough to allow dual citizenship yeah. in the first place. A lot of nations yeah. do not allow you to be a dual citizen, but you know, if you want to be a lawmaker, then obviously you have to make sure your sole allegiance is to Australia. We don't yeah. go as far as the United States and say that only uh, uh, citizens who were born uh, in the nation are eligible to be uh, the, the head of government because uh, both uh, Julie Gillard and Tony Abbott were born in the United Kingdom. So under uh, the United States system, they wouldn't have been able to be um, prime minister. It's interesting that uh, after uh, the Ludlam revelation, there's, well, there, there always was in the background, but there's a Tony Abbott Bertha movement, like trying to uh, claim that he never renounced his British citizenship. And Tony Abbott on the Friday, he tweeted out his renunciation form saying here's for the conspiracy theorists. And it's also worth pointing out that it's an indictment of the media that they didn't pick this up. I mean, uh, both Ludlam and Waters, they were both born overseas. I mean, wouldn't a journalist, it, it was discovered only by a lawyer, uh, John Cameron, who was actually trying to check if uh, Darren Hinch was a dual citizen, but found out that Scott Ludlam uh, was instead. Uh, so basically, it seems that the media, they don't tend to scrutinise, you know, leftists uh, yeah. as much as they should. Yeah, the media was scrutinizing Tony Abbott a lot. I mean, during the leadership spill, um, the fact that he, well, not the fact, sorry, the, the 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 rumor that he was a dual citizen, dual citizenship, dual citizen with the UK was flying around, you know, on social media, on 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 mainstream media everywhere, it was flying around. Um, but now, you know, despite knowing that these two people were born in a different country, the media isn't as vigilant on this. Um, as with with Tony Abbott, for example, or even with Julia Gillard. I mean, they weren't saying that she was a dual citizen. Or yeah, anything. there was no Bertha movement for, for her. Exactly. I mean, they, they both were contemporary, both from major parties, um, but nothing with Julia Gillard, but something with Tony Abbott. Um, again, very unfair. And, and it's funny because Lois of Waters today um, congratulated um, the media for keeping things accountable. <laughs> um, it's funny because, you know, the, I suppose you would be congratulating congratulate them because the, the media stayed for this long um, until they revealed who you are and where your allegiances are set. Um, but for Tony Abbott, it wasn't like that. For Jula Gillard, you know, it was like there is a waters again. Um, mainstream media, what do I expect from them? Well, it's interesting that citizens themselves are now starting starting to do some digging over who else might be ineligible to sit in federal parliament. And a while back, I wrote yeah. an article about Sam Dessiari when he was trying to virtue signal and criticise Trump's travel ban, said, oh, you know, I might not still be able to travel to the United States because I still might have Iranian citizenship. Uh, and so he basically opened up a can of worms to suggest that he could be a dual citizen. And views of that article uh, over the weekend skyrocketed so clearly uh, there's going to be some scrutiny of uh, other politicians and obviously Dastyari he might regret being so loose with his words yeah, it's nice to see that people are, you know, taking this to themselves. You know, the media isn't doing it for them, so the people have to now, you know, do it themselves. Um, it's nice to see that they are scrutinising whether these politicians have their sole interests, have their sole loyalty um, to to this country. You know, they want to make sure that their politicians are representatives of this country, not representatives of this country and secretly someone someone else's country. You know, because if you want to be in the Australian Parliament, you have to be an Australian citizen alone because you're you. Your, your interests must be aligned with our interests. And it's nice to see that Australian people are taking this into account and actually trying to find out to make sure that they, to make sure that they actually have politicians who are ruling um, in their interests. Yeah, I, I doubt that Dastyari is actually a dual citizen, but yeah. uh, I'm just making the point that he opened up the, the can of worms himself. And like, if there is a challenge to him, it's his own fault because he was more interested in virtue signaling. Yeah, and, and again, the media, the media didn't really focus much on this claim either, you know, as they did with Tony Abbott, for example. Again, shows what, again, shows what the media's, um, you know, plan is. Uh, so we'll see if there's any more revelations uh, in, in the next uh, few days and weeks, whether we have any more ineligible politicians in our federal parliament. But let's focus on our next topic now, which is, of course, the leftist media. They're now uh, decrying uh, how racist Australia is. I picked up 
two uh, two articles. Uh, there was actually a third one which I found afterwards. There was an editorial in the Saturday paper, which is a leftist newspaper funded by um, a left wing businessman, uh, Maury Schwartz. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't make any money that paper. It's just his vanity project. They they talked about oh their editorial was called Race to the Bottom and said that oh racism still alive and well and we've still got the vestiges of the white Australia policy. Uh, because of course last week there were those uh, posters put up by the uh, uh, Aussie nationalists uh, uh, Pokemon card ones, which were uh, making fun of Walid Ali and Yasmin Abdul Magid saying, got to catch and deport them all. I thought they were quite funny. What did you think? I thought they were funny. I mean, we must remember that, I mean, I it's not, I, I'm not saying we just, we agree completely with them. We're not saying that we need to deport every non-white person or anything. We do agree that um, Yasmin Abdul Majid and Walid Ali are completely ungrateful hypocritical and just pathetic people who are wasting our time, wasting their time and attacking the country that gave them those opportunities, attacking the country that gave them their freedom um, for no reason. You know, I think, I think, you know, the, the problem is Yasmin abdul Majid is someone who um, sought advice from the spokesman for, 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 for the, um, the Australian Islamic, the the Islamic the, the Islamic group. I think it was um his his Bul Yeah, yeah, yeah. His Bul I can't even pronounce their names. Um, you, he, she 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 actually um sought advice from the spokesman for his Bul and you know she asked him, you know, how can I appeal to Australian people more? How can I, you know, how can I get to them even more? Again, a good you know, a, a good representation of Takia or she trying to learn how to. Um, how to use Takia from a spokesperson from an Islamic extremist group. Um, you know, if we, if we can't deport people who have such connections to these groups, then you know, I don't, I, 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 I don't know anything. I, I don't have anything else to say. Uh, I should also point out that Walid Ali, he was born in Australia, so. Um... Uh, it's a bit more difficult to ask him to yeah. uh, leave, leave the country. Yeah. Um, uh, but who was asked to leave the country was uh, the Race Discrimination Commissioner, and who seems to be the uh, Australian Bachelor in Chief now that uh, Gillian Triggard is uh, on her way out, uh, Tim Supomasani. Uh, Rowan Dean said that if he didn't like Australia, why didn't he hop, hop on and go back on a plane to Laos? I mean, I don't see anything wrong with that. Firstly, it's not it's, it's not any you know curbing of their right to free speech. No one is trying to shut them down. Um, what they're saying is, you know, I think you should go back to Laos because you know you seem to prefer or you seem to hate the freedoms that this country has already given you, and you seem to you seem to be more suitable for a country that is different than us. Um, and they're saying that simply, you know, if you don't like it, just go back. Um, because, you know, you came here, you have these opportunities, you have this freedom, you are in a position, a high paying position um, that allows you to openly criticize, mock and make fun of this country for no reason whatsoever. I mean, if you don't like that, if you, if you think Australia is still a problematic, you know, racist place for you to live, then why don't you just go back to Laos because you seem to like that place more than here, this country which allowed you to be in this position in the first place. He won't go back because Laos is one of the poorest countries in the yeah. world. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the other article uh, that you know was uh, calling Australia racist was by uh, another left wing website, uh, Junkie, um, oh, yeah. which, which is basically the name says it all. It's junk. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's uh, listed all the times that Australia was racist in the past week. And it mentioned, it still mentioned the, the Channel 7 poll about uh, Yasmin. Like, that was a few weeks ago now. Uh, you remember that we created our own poll in the interest of free speech. And they also picked up on the uh, comments by radio host uh, Prue McSweeney who uh, said that uh, if she saw uh, Yasmin on the street, she, uh, she, uh, uh, she would find it difficult to swerve out of the way. Yeah, um, yeah, that was quite funny, I think. Um, again, you know, she was, just, she was just joking. You know, she wasn't actually 
didn't actually mean what she was saying. It was called comedy. Um, and I think you need to stop taking things a bit too seriously sometimes. Um, because, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's how it is. You know, people don't mean all that what they say. They're just, you know, using some sort of comedic expression um, to sort of to try and emphasize the fact that people like Asmin Abdul Majid are, you know, simply a pain in the backside. Um, because as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, she's the one who said, for example, that you know, Islam is a feminist religion. I mean, that doesn't make sense. Are you trying to brainwash people or are you trying to, you know, are you trying to be intentionally stupid on public television by saying that your religion, which equates women with cattle, which, you know, kills homosexuals, um, are you saying that that religion is a somehow a feminist religion because you know that you know the Quran wouldn't agree with your interpretation of it. Um, so you know again, you know, of course no one is no one wants to have to run over them but, but with a car. You know, no one's saying that. But the thing is, the point is, your display of your you know incompetence is just you know reason enough to make you really annoying for us. Oh, well, Yasmin's in London now, so she better be on the lookout for stray vans. Well, yes, I think, I think, you know, what she should be, I think, you know, the fact that, you know, people are being encouraged, you know, thanks, you know, Islamism is encouraging our citizens to be criminals now because, you know, our citizens can't take any more of these Islamic problems. Um, and so I think, you know, she should, she, she, I hope she is on the lookout. And it's also worth pointing out that, you know, white regressives are criticised as well. We're not criticising uh, yeah. people like Walid, Yasmin and uh, uh, Tim because they're, you know, people of colour, because their, you know, arguments are stupid. I mean, yeah, yeah like, like you just mentioned, you know, Islam is a feminist religion. And those uh, Aussie nationalist posters, one of their targets was uh, Sarah Hansen Young, and arguably that... Uh, the, that Pokemon poster was more savage about her because they just called for Waleed and Yasmin to be deported while they called for Sarah Hansen Young to be hung. I mean, that's a bit more yeah. extreme there. And it's also uh, worth pointing out other leading regressives such as, you know, Gillian Triggs. And in case you think it's only white women being picked on, uh, Daniel Andrews is probably one of the, the biggest regressives in the country. Dan Andrews, Malcolm Turnbull, you know, Bill Shorten, you know, we pick. On, we pick on people based on what they say, not based on their skin color. Um, you know, we pick. We, I mean, I know that I understand. That there are a lot of Muslims. I understand there are lots of Muslims who are grateful to stay here, who are, you know, thankful to come to this country, and they do assimilate in many ways. You know, um, they may be a minority, but they do assimilate. I, I we understand that. Um, you know, we are picking people based on what they say because their arguments are completely out of whack. You know, they they just they do do not make sense at all. Um, they're attacking a country. You know, that gave them all, you know, they're attacking a country that allowed, you know, a woman, an Islamic woman to become an engineer, you know, that allowed an Islamic woman to openly, you know, um, express her views without having any, you know, without, without having any official threat to her life or livelihood. Um, you know, she was given a position in the national broadcaster. You know, does that happen in Somalia? Does, do, you know, do white women in Somalia or where are you from, um, do they, are they able to, or Sudan, I think, are they able to um, have a such, such a position in a national broadcaster? I don't think so. They're not. Okay. Um, you know, you are a Islamic woman and you are given that position where, you know, even women in your own country probably are finding, finding hard to get in there. Um, so, you know, she mentioned that, um, that she gets death threats, she gets, you know, people send her really bad videos um, about, you know, raping her or, you know, about deporting her or something. You know, everyone goes through that. You know, Andrew Bolt goes through that. He has to protect his family. You know, he's he, he's on a constant security guard. Um, he has to protect his family from people who hate him. And he is a cis white male. OK, so this problem isn't just what it's just for you. It, Every person who's controversial goes through this, no matter what religion, no matter what skin color or what gender they are. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, like getting death threats is like just part of being a, a public figure. It is. Like she, she's yeah. not special. And it's also worth pointing out that there's many uh, colored people, you know, on the right side of politics. I mean, there's you, uh, yeah. for example, there's uh, Rita Panahi, and there's also uh, Tanvi Ahmed, who we've had on yeah. this uh, podcast before. And, you know, they're... Uh, People on the right, you know, don't say, "Oh, I don't want to," you know, them to be a spokesperson because they're coloured. Like they're they're happy for for these people to be their spokesperson because you know they speak common sense. 
Yeah, there's also, I must say, there's also the um, Imam Tahiri, I think, or Tahiri, I think, um, the Shiite Imam in Australia who is who criticizes Islam, who, you know, who, who says that, you know, Islam is this, who says that the Quran says um, all these particular quotes and verses. Um, you know, he supports progressive values. I don't in many ways, but he still supports, you know, relatively progressive values. Um, and, you know, people celebrate those, you know, People love Imam Tahiri. Um, you know, all the people who who you are saying are white nationalists or white supremacists, they love and celebrate Imam Tahiri, which itself I think is quite concerning um, because Takiya is is a problem after all. Um, but you know, the point is, you know, no one is being racist. Okay, people are be, are hating your views, not your race. Okay, because the fact that people are supporting are completely supporting, you know, a Jewish person and an Islamic Imam who are pointing out the truth, that just shows that they are not racist, they are just against your incompetent views. But overall what this criticism means is that we're starting to, to win the war against these regressives in Australia and fighting political correctness because of course when the left they have no arguments, that's when they cry, you know, racism and, and bigotry. Yeah, yeah true, I mean they lack any actual constructive thing to say anymore. So I think they understand that, you know, we are, we, we do have a high ground. Um, so they are just, you know, bl blasting out these buzzwords um, created by the communists, you know, back in the past um, to try and, you know, tr to try and get public support. But I think people are seeing through their, to, through their charades and seeing that, you know, we are the ones who have a point. Yeah, Australians aren't that easily intimidated by, you know, people uh, 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 throwing, you know, uh, unsubstantiated accusations at them, you know, such as racists. They really resent that. I mean, most Australians, you know, just want to go and live their lives and have a cohesive community and they don't, uh, don't appreciate, you know, all these leftists saying like, you know, look at how horrible and bigoted you are. Yeah, because, you know, we aren't bigoted, we aren't horrible, you know, you have equal opportunities. Um, our government has given you, as, as I mentioned, you are now a national, in, the, in the national broadcast employed by the, the ABC. Oh, um, Sorry, was employed until, you know, your show was taken down for good, re well, we are hoping for good reasons. The ABC says it was, for, it was for financial reasons, but we are hoping it will it was for the other reason that we wanted it to. Um, but, you know, you were given that position. You were you were given a position in Channel 10, um, which is, you know, Channel 10 did itself harm by giving you that position. Um, you know, you are criticizing, your policies, are your, your views are resulting in policies that result in, you know, white men who are having their opportunities slashed because of affirmative action programs. Who cares about them? You know, there are people who deserve those positions more than you because of their talent, but then they have their opportunities slashed because, you know, they want to give, have diversity or they want to give other people a go, even though those other other white men, they may be even more talented and they may deserve it even more. They probably worked hard for it even more, but they have the opportunity slashed. That's not, that's not fair. Okay. And that's thanks to your views. And that's thanks to you, you know, going around, running around the country saying that, you know, you are oppressed for no reason. Oh, well, let's hope that it's a sign that our governments will, will start to listen to the people, but that will prove a much harder task. I think it will be, you know, especially when we have Malcolm Turnbull in the helm, it might be quite hard. <laughs> oh, well, we're seeing the growth of yeah, Pauline Hanson and Cory Bernardi, so clearly the, the people are starting to yeah. uh, make her that they've had enough of, you know, political correctness, open borders, you know, forced multiculturalism. Yeah, yeah people don't, Australian people do not want a prime minister who won an award for having some sort of open immigration policy. We want a prime minister like Pauline Hanson, who is also a woman, mind you, um, you know, we want a prime minister who, you know, cares about the country and wants to make sure the country doesn't get sunk under all these, you know, globalist or leftist agendas. Okay, so let's move on to the final news of the day, which was the, it was, it, it was rumoured to uh, be in the pipeline for a few days now, but it was announced today by Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, uh, Attorney General George Brandis, uh, uh, current Immigration Minister Peter Dutton that a new Australian Home Affairs Department would be formed with Peter Dutton as the 
new Home Affairs Minister. Now, it's considered a controversial proposal. It's even been described as a captain's pick because um, it's been criticised by security experts who say that our agencies are already working well together. And there was a re review during the Rudd years who advised against the uh, creation of a Home Affairs Department. And also, uh, civil libertarians have said that they have concerns that this new Home Affairs Department could erode uh, civil liberties uh, further. It's it's certainly something that uh, warrants uh, analysis. I mean, it's based on the UK uh, Home Office, but experience shows that you know if the UK with it is currently with you know all the terror attacks that are happening. I mean, having a centralised Home Office hasn't really uh, prevented it prevented uh, terrorism. Yeah, I think we did um, have many scandals in the UK where, you know, people actually, the, the, the Home Office actually knew about those terrorists and knew about those extremists, um, but did nothing, did nothing. Um, so, you know, I think those scandals might come to our country if, you know, we do centralise it. Um, I am all for policies that result in cracking down on terrorists, cracking, cracking down on extremists, that expose extremists. Um, however, I think we do already have a very good system, um, and I think it's in many ways the envy of the world. Um, and I think it allows a, a bit of a competitive um, environment in that um, in that field in security because I think that's what allowed us to actually um, you know take down many um, terrorists like we saw in Melbourne with the terrorists for example so I think the system we have now is good I do not see why we need to change it um, since it's been working well yeah Malcolm Turnbull said it's not because the system is broken but because we want to improve it that was the spin that he pulled on that so the new home office it will have uh, AGO uh, the Australian Federal Police and the Australian Border Force all under the umbrella of the uh, Home Affairs Department and the Attorney General will act as a uh, ch check and balance on the operation of the Home Affairs Department. So Turnbull tried to spin it as, you know, we're, uh, we're going to be having all the operational aspects of intelligence being conducted by the, the Home Office and we'll have the Attorney General there just to, you know, double check everything and they'll still issue uh, warrants uh, for uh, various intelligence uh, operations. Um, yeah, so I've, I think that, um, you know, obviously Peter Dutton has been doing very well in immigration. I think that he should be the next Liberal Prime Minister. I'm a big Peter Dutton fan. Uh, so I have no doubt that he will um, do well in this um, in this new role. I mean, he's, he's certainly capable given, given what he's achieved already. But yes, the the question of could our freedoms be taken away a bit further uh, is is worth discussing um, because the reason why you know I you know oppose further um, immigration from the the Middle East is because I don't want to see you know ordinary citizens' civil liberties taken away. I mean, is, is the price of open borders that we have to live under a police state? You know, I don't want that, and so. Uh, Turnbull's recently announced action on uh, he, he wants access to encryption services uh, uh, such as Wicca, which is quite ironic because Malcolm Turnbull used Wicca to plot his leadership challenge against Tony Abbott. Maybe Malcolm Turnbull wants access to Wicca so he can uh, spy on Tony Abbott to see what he's up to. Maybe, who knows? But I think, um, yeah, I think, you know, having this first, well, I think the impact on of this on civil liberties, I'm not sure if it will have an impact um, in, you know, I, I'm not sure if, if it will automatically lead to a police state. Um, it will if they use this and they use this as an excuse to take in more migrants. That would be a problem you know, they could they could say that you know now since we do have a new home home office style um security um, establishment we can now take in more migrants since we are assuming it's safer that'll be a very um bad way that things will turn out um my concern is based on you know the inefficiencies of having this one overarching um organization which may result in what happened in the uk for example um with you know as i mentioned people were let out People, you know, they knew they were terrorists, they knew they were extremists, but they did nothing. Um, and I think ultimately the 
best solution to solving this terrorism crisis is not to improve or change our security organizations or security um, protocol or whatever, is to is to ban Islamic immigration. That's the best solution. Um, you know, changing our system won't do anything. You know, we already have one of the best in the world. We had all those terrorists in Melbourne, in Sydney, in many places in the in, in the country. Um, you know, and th that was one of the that's because it was one of the best systems you know changing it or improving it won't work because the the, the the real solution is to ban islamic immigration because that'll prevent more terrorists from coming in um but no nope, they continue they continue ignoring the real solution in favor of this this i don't know this pr stunt i suppose um and they might even use this change to try and take in more refugees saying that you know we can now take in more refugees since we have a better um system which we don't even know if it's true if it's real yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a double whammy. I mean, we get, you know, all these, you know, migrants come in who, you know, cause all this, um, you know, so a social unrest. And we also get our freedom taken away by, by the governments. It's the, it's the worst of both. Yeah. And you're exactly yeah. right that, you know, the, uh, accessing these encryption services won't make any difference because how often have we heard after every terrorist attack that they were no one to police? I mean, you know, it seems to me that it's just government's failure to act rather than they haven't got enough information. They've clearly got the information, they just don't act on it. Exactly. And, you know, those situations happened mainly in the UK. Um, and the thing is, I know that correlations aren't always causations. However, the UK has this system. So, you know, if those um, scandals happen in the UK where police knew about them um, and they already have a home office style centralised you know, uh, organization, then it might happen here as well. Um, so, you know, I think it's better to leave it the way it is and focus on the real solution. And for those who, like, on the right who say that, you know, oh, well, you know, we've got, you know, good people in charge of, you know, the new Home Affairs Department, uh, you know, that, that'll make sure that it's used for the right reasons. But you have to remember that, you know, if the Labor Party got back into power, they might use the, the power of the Home Affairs Department to, you know, crack down on, you know, rightly yeah. hate speech, as they yeah. call it. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, that is, I think that is the biggest, um, you know, fear I have right now. And that is the biggest threat we could, that's the worst situation we could actually have. Because, you know, the problem with a, um, I guess, a representative democracy, well, not a problem, the thing is the incompatibility, the incompatibility between a democracy like ours and, you know, this sort of, quasi authoritarian you know centralized measure is that you know if labor gets in which they most likely will next time then you know they they can actually use this and infiltrate this system and then use it for their own purposes you know julian triggered she said you know oh was it julian yes it was julian triggs said that said that um you know it's it's sad that we can't um monitor people around the dinner tables and even though we have this agency we have everything it's sad we can't monitor people in their homes in the dinner tables saying racist things, um, you know, if they have this system and then it results in some slippery slope where they have they, they have more surveillance, where they have more um, ways to investigate people, then it's going to result in something even worse. Um, so, you know, the problem, the main, the major problem, you may, you may think that this may not have any um, impact on the short term, but on the long term, it can have an impact if Labour gets in and they use this for their own left-wing purposes. Yeah. As I mean, like we've heard Theresa May, for example, that say that you know is Islamophobia is a form of extremism. Yeah. So yeah, uh, expect the the left here to you know say uh, say something similar and you know use the the power of government to you know oh we've got to crack down on you know other extremism as well. But it's obviously this Home Affairs Department has just been announced, so it's obviously very early days. But we'll see how it unfolds and yeah, hopefully it works and, you know, it does keep us safe without, you know, hindering our freedoms. Yeah, and hopefully, you know, Labour doesn't use it for any, you know, any evil purposes other than protecting us and, you know, making sure that, you know, other terrorist attacks don't happen, but they will because the real solution still hasn't been um, considered. Well, that's all we've got uh, time for today. Hopefully, by the time this podcast goes up, there won't be more breaking news that this podcast will be old already. So let, let's hope that's the end of the news day. Well, hopefully, I'm hoping that we get more green senators, and you know, I'm hoping that this time, the, the time this goes up, you know, I'm hoping the greens will no longer be there. Um, let's hope that happens.
Yeah, I haven't checked my uh, phone during this podcast, so something else might have happened. Yeah. Um, but thank you once again, Suka, for being my co-host. It was my pleasure. Uh, and we are still working on some very exciting projects for The Unshackled. We will bring you the news of them once uh, they are completed, so please stay tuned. And, of course, the usual reminders apply. If you haven't signed up for the email list, please do so at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Please consider supporting the work of The Unshackled by becoming a patron on Patreon because we've arranged some awesome benefits for supporting us. Don't forget there's Unshackled merchandise on sale at uprightmarket.com. And, of course, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you can do so on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep checking the unshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye.